Yeah, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, some of you may know me as an uh, interventional electrophysiologist. My, my business career is uh, driven by the idea to replace drugs by interventions. I do that for three decades now with some contributions and some success. I'm not the typical guy that you can call a roadblock for innovations and new therapies. But everything we do in the field of intervention needs to make sense and we have to do it carefully and we have to keep a key, a key focus on the patient. Patient comes first. I'd like to share with you some ideas now why I am so reluctant in order to extend the indications for left atrial appendage occlusion. If you need to, uh, to uh, consider the value of new therapies, it's always the uh, balance between risks and benefits and uh, therapeutic alternatives. And we need to go to the alternatives that we have in order to define the clear role of Laos very, very briefly. And then we need to look to the data that we have on the Laos very clearly and scientifically. And then we need to decide. We have oral anticoagulation, rhythm control, left atrial occlusion devices. Oral anticoagulation, just 15 seconds. The strengths of these data are really, have, been, have been shared with you before and are really amazing and wonderful by the same time. This is the key innovation in the field of atrial fibrillation of the last decade with a strong reduction of stroke and systemic, systemic embolism as compared to warfarin, better than warfarin. And we need good arguments to withhold this from the patients that require oral anticoagulation. This is a trend or even a significant reduction in total mortality which has been achieved by these drugs. And that's why these drugs receive a strong and received a strong recommendation in the current guidelines and the guideline update. I love rhythm control. I love catheter ablation. Let's take a very quick look on the role of catheter ablation for stroke prevention. There are several non-randomized observational studies indicating that you can reduce the stroke rate by, by catheter ablation. However, when it comes to the analysis of randomized studies and you compare the strokes with catheter ablation versus enterythmic drug therapy in rhythm control, and catheter ablation is stronger than enterythmic drugs, you need to, you need to, to uh, recognize there is nothing, there is no stroke prevention proven by catheter ablation. So we can make it very, very quick and short. No relevant data, no recommendation, no indication rhythm control for stroke prevention. Now let's take a look to the Lao techniques and let's stay really serious and interpret the data not too enthusiastic. Let's differentiate between the role and the value of randomized control trials, registries and other observational studies. It's a significant difference between the quality and the impact of these, of these data. I took out the, the data on surgical Lao occlusion which showed that there are no data for surgical occlusion or excision of the left atrial appendage because it does not work. We, we move directly into, into uh, the Lao area. 15 years since the PLATO device has been introduced. A single randomized trial in 15 years of so-called progress. This must raise concerns. There must be reason why this is the case. This study has seven, only 707 patients. The results have been shared with you. I just want to make the following point. Protect RF, and we should not forget that. Protect RF was statistically underpowered to prove non-inferiority for the outcome of greatest interest, which is stroke. So we have not a single study on that endpoint, a single randomized study. Complications, I'm not worried about complications. I think that the procedure, and uh, uh, this has been shown in observational studies, that the procedure in the future can be done without significant complications. We, I have done other things to the left atrium than just putting in a plug, I tell you. 
I'm sure that this can be very, very safely done in the future. I have my concerns on the efficiency side rather than on the safety side. We need to go, can we go one back, please? Looking to, to the data that have not been published, Prevail was announced for ACC last year, could not be presented for various reasons. I never fully understood what happened. We need to await full publication of these data. If you take a look to the data as we can at this point in time, we need to realize that in Prevail, that showed safety, as far as I un understand the data, Second primary endpoints were not met. And it's interesting how these data are presented. And I don't think that this is adequate with a, with a summary as on this slide that I've taken from one of the presentations. The control group had a lower than, expect, had lower than expected event rates, overperforming of the control group. We have the results in the control group as they are. And this cannot be the explanation why this endpoint was not met in this study. I don't think that this is the best scientific access for the interpretation of the data. And we need to await publication of these data. ASAP is one of the, the big uh, uh, registries, the CAP registry, other registries are coming up. Registries are valuable. They are nice to have. It, they give a good perspective. But they are not guideline relevant. We have had too many disappointments with registries, and we, we need to, to uh, really carefully consider that. Look at, look at this. This looks very, very nice if you say stroke rate 7.3% reduced to 1.7%, but this is just a comparison in a registry to expected data. It has never been me measured in a head-to-head -head comparison. Consider what would have happened to the Simplicity 3 trial in the United States that we're going to listen to next week, if the data would have been compared, the treatment data with previous acquired data, with expected data, it would have been beautiful and wonderful. The randomized data showed it did not meet the endpoint. And I have the same concerns in this field. Last point before I come to my conclusion is that there is a significant rate of device-related problems. There is a significant rate of uh, residual peri-device flow. In short-term follow-up, it seems not to be relevant with respect to stroke, but we talk about long-term risks. It's one of my concerns. There is thrombus on the device, up to 17%, as in this publication. It needs to, to be taken uh, into consideration. So, my concerns on the Lao techniques for extending the indications is that we have only one study which is underpowered. We still have a significant complication rate of 4%, which can be overcome. I said that openly. No data obtained in patients with high stroke uh, risk and no strong data on post-interventional management of these, of these patients. My previous last slide. This has been published in Jack 2014 from one of the key promoters of, uh, of left atrial appendage occlusion. And they say such a device, if it were safe and effective, might avoid the need for anticoagulation and prevent stroke in a large number of patients who are currently not treated with anticoagulants. Not treated with anticoagulants. Regularity approval has been difficult due to trial design challenges, balance in risk-benefit ratio, specific patient population studies, selection of treatment in the control group and specific endpoints and statistical analysis selected, indicating that we have a data problem on the field. I do not understand, I do not understand how they come up with a, with a conclusion or recommendation that it can be an alternative to anticoagulation in carefully selected patient population. We would not have published that at European Heart Journal. So my summary. For surgical uh, LAO, as I indicated, there are no relevant data. For interventional LAO, there are few randomized, underpowered uh, studies that indicate non-inferiority to warfarin uh, in, patients pop in the patient population with AF and a low risk of stroke. My most important and striking point is that we do not have any data comparing the LAOs uh, with the direct oral uh, anticoagulation drugs which are current 
standard in the field. We have a 2B indication for the procedure for a very, very small subset of patients, and I hope that it's going to stay that way until we have stronger data to support left atrial occlusion device technology. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Gerd. This was a clear statement, and now is it's Professor Kemp's task to show us that um, the occluder is ready for rollout for wider use. John, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Gerd, for uh, presenting the reasons why we can only use the device in patients contraindicated to so-called NOACs. On this slide, you can see what the first entry on Google is for NOAC. It is the National Order of the Arrow Conference in the United States. And um, I think that I'm being asked specifically to try and address the issue of um, whether these therapies are essentially complementary or competitive. If they're complementary, I think you could say that just in patients who cannot take oral anticoagulants, the device is available. But if they're competitive, of course, you could say that uh, even patients who are suitable for anticoagulation could elect, for one reason or another, to take this device. I'm supposed to be uh, against this particular motion, so I think we should look a little bit at the motion. It says patients with contraindication for NOAX are the only candidates for left atrial appendage occlusion, the only candidates. So if I can find one reason why we should implant a left atrial appendage occlusion device, one reason, in a patient who is not contraindicated to anticoagulants, then the motion should be defeated. Now, I think we should also ask what does NOACs mean, and I'm not talking about the national order of whatever. This is an interesting way of putting NOAC. Uh, it is N in brackets and followed by OAC. So what does that mean? Does it stand as the term NOAC now stands for, for non-VKA oral anticoagulant? Or does this particular way of putting it means uh, either a non-VKA oral anticoagulant or a VKA oral anticoagulant? Or does it mean both a non-oral a non-VKA oral anticoagulant and a VKA oral anticoagulant? Well, I don't know. So I decided I'd better find out a little bit about my opponent, so I also looked him up on Google. If any of you are connected, you could go along with me and uh, do this. If you just type Gerhard Hendricks into Google and press image, you can see these pictures of Gerhard Hendricks or Karl Heinz Hendricks, or Anne Hendricks, or Sabine Hendricks. They're all there under Gerhard Hendricks. I did find a picture of him in the end, so I knew who I was going to be debating. So let's go and get down to uh, what the substance of this debate is. What are the possible indications? Well, they can range to contraindications, and uh, Gerd uh, discussed that. But we could also include uncertainties about the use of any form of oral anticoagulation. We could include patients who we suspect might not be reliable pill takers who have problems with adherence. But I'm sure Gerd would argue that these two categories are really contraindications to uh, oral anticoagulants. But then we have a group of patients who are unwilling to take oral anticoagulants. And this is no small group. This is approximately 40% of those who should be anticoagulated, but who refuse anticoagulation. And then we have the interesting possibility that we're actually talking with regard to the left atrial appendage occlusion device of a therapy which is superior 
to oral anticoagulation. Well, here are the only two randomized controlled trials that have been conducted of the left atrial appendage occlusion device. And as you both know, they were conducted in patients without any contraindications to oral anticoagulants. Both of them were positive to a degree. We'll discuss some of this positive signal in a while, but both were positive, randomized, controlled clinical trials in patients who did not have contraindications to oral anticoagulants. So as the young friends of my medical student son would say, Gerd, are you on crack? So let's um, have a look at uh, some of these issues further. I know that you've seen these data already. These are the data from the European multicenter study that uh, Postulus shows, showed to us. These were the indications. Now, of course, these are not necessarily well thought out indications, but they are the indications used by the investigators. These people are voting with their hands, so to speak. This is what they think. So there are on this list of indications several, which I don't think we would class as a contraindication to oral anticoagulants like previous minor bleeding, an ischemic stroke on warfarin, or CAD plus stenting. So there are clearly other reasons for implanting such a device. Now, if we look at the latest results from Protect AF, we are told that these results show superiority of the, in this case, Watchman device against an oral anticoagulant, in this case, warfarin. Now, it's true to say that we don't have trials against novel oral anticoagulants, and it's true to say we don't have randomized controlled trials involving all the left atrial appendage occlusion devices. The endpoint in this trial were not stroke and systemic embolism, as in most of the anticoagulant trials, but they included mortality, not a bad additional endpoint. And you can see that the rate ratio in this trial was 0.6. In other words, a 40% reduction compared with warfarin. And if you look at the credibility intervals, they span from 0.41 to 1.05. And 1.05 means that there is only a 5% chance that this result is not superiority of the Watchman device over warfarin in this trial. And you can see these other very critical endpoints, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and hemorrhagic stroke are all definitely superior with the Watchman device. Now, how does the result in, for example, the Watchman trial compare with the results of oral anticoagulants. Well, I think you can see, if you look on the right-hand side, that in PROTECT AF, there was a significant reduction in the absolute risk of stroke and systemic embolism in this case. Let's have a look at this in more detail. So on this slide, I'm plotting the risk reduction, relative risk reduction, and absolute risk reduction. And you can see as far as relative risk reduction of stroke and systemic embolism is concerned, only dabigatran was associated with a greater relative risk reduction when compared with warfarin than the left atrial appendage occlusion device. And if you look at all-cause mortality, none of the novel or non-VKA oral anticoagulants was anywhere near as good as was warfarin with a practically 35% reduction in all-cause mortality. And let's now look at these absolute risk reductions. And here we can see 
that amongst these therapies, all compared with warfarin, the stroke and systemic embolism absolute risk reduction was greater with the appendage occluder than with any novel oral anticoagulant. And as far as mortality absolute risk reduction was concerned, the mortality reduction was much greater with the Watchman device compared with these novel oral anticoagulants. So there is at least a good case to be made that these devices are superior to oral anticoagulants of any kind. Now, there are particular settings, of course, in which bleeding is a very high risk. And one of those is when dual antiplatelet therapy is added to conventional oral anticoagulation or to non-VKA oral anticoagulation. Results from RELY, and you can see hazard ratios of the combination of 1.5 to 1.7, depending on the drug dose and uh, specifics of the situation. But clearly, there are cases where the risk of hemorrhage is much greater than can be tolerated. We also know, of course, that these novel oral anticoagulants are not all sweetness and light, particularly with regard to GI bleeding. Here are the results with dabigatran, a clear excess of GI bleeding. And we've recently seen in the New York Times a headline saying, study of drug for blood clots caused a stir. The study was this one, in which they showed that the dabigatran level was critical to the reduction of strokes on the, on the one hand and the likelihood of major bleeds on the other hand. And there are many covariates that influence this. It doesn't take a genius to put these two images together and get an image which just looks like INR for warfarin and the sweet spot in the middle. And it won't be long, as the investigators here say, that individual benefit risk might be improved by tailoring doses to selected patient characteristics. Nothing like as simple and straightforward as we thought. And is the left atrial appendage occlusion device cost effective? Here are data from Canada appearing in circulation last year. You can see that the device is cost effective provided you are prepared to spend about 50,000 Canadian dollars per quality adjusted life year. And any amount after that, it is highly cost effective. And therefore, this is a cost effective therapy. The authors said percutaneous left atrial appendage occlusion represents a novel therapy for stroke reduction that is cost effective compared with warfarin for patients at risk who have non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And throughout this experiment, you can see that dabigatran, a novel oral anticoagulant, was completely dominated. So let's have a look at a hierarchy of possible indications for the left atrial appendage occlusion device. Where would we put our limit? Would we put it after the first two? and ignore all the other indications, or would we put, be much more generous and just exclude the last two? Well, how many of these indications are contraindications to oral anticoagulant? Well, these are, and you can see the top one, ischemic stroke despite adequate anticoagulation, and the bottom three are not contraindications to oral anticoagulants. So what do uh, more modern guideline groups think? The, these are 2014 guidelines. They're coming from NICE in the United Kingdom. This is the antithrombosis algorithm. And you can see a section in the middle of this algorithm in which left atrial appendage occlusion is considered. And the specific wording, if I magnify it for you, says, consider left atrial appendage occlusion if anticoagulation is contraindicated or not tolerated. 
and discuss the benefits and risks of left atrial appendage occlusion with the person. Now, this is more than contraindicated. So the motion states patients with contraindications for NOAC are the only candidates for left atrial appendage occlusion, but it's wrong. We need to insert the word not. Patients with contraindications for NOAC are not the only candidates for left atrial appendage occlusion, and therefore, GERD and Mr. Chairman, the motion must be defeated.